Um, well, I'm going to proceed and uh, just say hello um, and ask how you're all doing this evening. Uh, the French call this hour of the day the l'heure de l'aperitif. So I'd like to encourage uh, each one of you to pour a boisson of your choice, maybe a glass of rosé or a jus d'orange, or my own favorite, a sparkling flute of Kir Royal. I know that many of you consider the RISD Museum a home away from home, and I'm sure you miss being able to visit. I feel the same way. So tonight, I thought we'd have a virtual cocktail party in the galleries. Manet's painting of Berthe Morisot, who would become his sister-in-law, and Morisot's painting of Julie, her daughter, will be the subjects of our conversation tonight. They intimately describe the importance of home and the connections between friends and family that sustain us throughout our lives. I'm starting, however, with a compliment for all of you who are staying at home these days. Picasso's After Theater Diners, painted in 1901, remind us that going out for drinks isn't always what it's cracked up to be. Sometimes it's best to stay in. Our hostess tonight is the Impressionist painter Bert Morisot, whose significance was revisited and acclaimed in an exhibition that recently closed in Paris. Morisot had spent all of her artistic life there and died in Paris in 1895. She was born in the city of Bourges, where her father held a government post, and then moved with her family to other provincial cities before they settled in Paris in 1852. Bert, who was 11 at the time, was enrolled with her sisters at the Sacred Heart Academy, now the home of the Rodin Museum, and then followed secondary school studies in history and literature. She also received lessons in music and art. In this early painting by Morisot of her mother and sister Edma, painted in 1869, the interior of the family home reveals a taste for flowered chintz and mirrored reflections. No heavy draperies or dull colored walls prevent Morisot from demonstrating her interest in painting the effects of light. Around this time, the Morisot and Manet families had become friends. Their social positions were similar and they shared an intellectual openness to contemporary ideas. Bert and her sisters, Edma and Eve, were well-educated and proficient at music and art. The three Manet sons, Edouard, Eugène, and Gustave, were comfortably well off and were not required to pursue remunerative professions. Edouard had already made a name for himself among advanced art circles and had gained notoriety for, for such paintings as Olympia and Le Déjeuner Solaire, which you see on the screen. The reclining figure on the right in the Déjeuner is a composite of his two brothers, Eugène and Gustave. In 1868, Manet invited Berthe Morisot to model for a staged composition called Le, Le Balcon, The Balcony. Uh, he painted a total of 10 oil paintings of her over the course of their friendship. In 1870, when the Franco-Prussian War shut down life in Paris, both Manet and Morisot remained in the city to care for their parents during months of deprivation and urban chaos. Around this time, Morisot modeled for repose, most likely in Manet's home or studio, where other family members would have been present as chaperones. The portrait was not exhibited until 1873, when Paris was recovering from the damages of war and the indemnity extracted by the Prussians as conditions of peace. It was later owned by two different private collectors before it passed into the hands of the dealer Durand Ruel. In 1898, it was sold to the American millionaire George W. Vanderbilt, becoming one of the first paintings by Manet to enter, enter an American collection. In 1959, it came to the RISD Museum as a bequest of his widow, Rhode Islander Edith Vanderbilt Gary. When we look at repose today, we're captivated by Morisot's striking appearance. Her voluminous white dress, her elegantly outstretched arms, the tip of a black slipper poking out at the bottom of the composition, and by the riotous Japanese woodblock print that hangs above 
the, the plush tufted uh, sofa on which she is seated. We can simply compare it with Marceau's portrait of her mother and sister, which we saw just a moment ago, who are seated properly at home. And by doing that, we can understand how scandalous Marceau appeared to bourgeois French viewers at the Salon of 1873. More significant, perhaps, is Marceau's averted gaze, as if she's lost in reverie or bored or uncomfortable from holding the pose, a fact that Judy, Julie later reported in her memoirs. To return to that notable detail in the, in the painting, this is the Japanese woodblock print that hangs above her head. Its title, The Pearl Diver with the Magic Crystal Pursued by the Dragon King, contrasts dramatically with the relaxed gestures of Marceau's pose. In 1874, Marceau married Edouard Manet's brother, Eugène, and by then had become, she had become a leading participant in the exhibitions of the Impressionist group. She exhibited with them at, at seven out of eight of their group exhibitions over the next 12 years, missing only 1879, following the birth of their daughter, Julie. The next two images I'm showing you are a photograph of Julie uh, with her parents at, at a country home in Bougival in 1880. Julie's around two years old or one and a half here. And then another photograph about a year later of Julie with her father seated in the garden in Bougival, where she's playing with an architecture game that's, that's placed on his lap. Actually, Bert Morisot painted very few portraits of her husband, Eugène. Uh, the two that we've just seen, this one and the painting at the Isle of Wight, where he's seated in a window, are the most prominent ones. The Manet Morisot family lived in several different residences while Julie was very little. But in 1883, they built a family home in the same part of Paris where Bert had grown up. The area known as Passy lies just to the west of the city in the 16th arrondissement. The 16th stretches from the Bois de Boulogne at the far west to the Seine at its southern edge and touches the monumental center of Paris at the Arc de Triomphe. The star that you see represents the spot on the Rue de Villejuste where Eugène Manet and Bert Marisot built their home. This view, which is a, an aerial view of that region taken more recently, shows you something that I'd like you to notice, which is that broad avenue in the upper left corner that angles out to the, left, to the far left. This, in fact, is the Boulevard du Bois de Boulogne. It's now called the Avenue Foch, and you may know it by that name. But it's generally an area where pa Parisian visitors to Paris don't wander on foot. Instead, they spend their time at the direct um, vertical line at the bottom with, is the Champs-Élysées, and from there, far down back to the east toward the Tuileries and the, and the Louvre. So you might not be so familiar with this thoroughfare, but you can see how splendid it is. In the 19th century, the broad boulevard leading from Etoile to the Bois de Boulogne was the primary place to see and be seen. The wide avenue was lined with two park-like dividers that separated the busy thoroughfare from the magnificent private homes and apartment buildings that lined the concourse. Carriages, strollers, men and women on horseback paraded along the boulevard in good weather, nodding to friends and acquaintances and showing off their wealth and their good connections. Anyone who has read Marcel Proust knows the social importance of this splendid concourse. And anyone who knows Jacqueline Kennedy will also recall that she shared a home at the far end of the boulevard with her second husband, Aristotle Onassis. This is 88 Avenue Foch, which is at the, at the end of the um, Boulevard de Boulogne, closest to, to, the, uh, to the Bois. It was, uh, it, the name was changed after the First World War to celebrate the Supreme Allied Commander, General Ferdinand Foch. The Manet Morisot home was more modest than the Avenue Foch mansions but it was designed to accommodate Bert Morisot's artistic practice and to house other family members as well as their own family unit. I'd like you to take a good look at the facade. You'll notice two, the arches of two portals on either side of a triple window and then two balconies above. And on the, on the top floor, um, there are no balconies, but there is another uh, a suite of, apart of apartment rooms. Here you see the salon windows close up with those two portals. Manet's mother, that is the mother of Eugène, 
and Edouard and Gustave lived on the premier étage where the first balcony is during the last years of her life. And Marceau's nieces lived there as well during their lives. But Marceau and her husband lived on the ground floor, which was in fact two stories high. It featured a salon in front uh, and a with a bank of three windows. And you can see that salon right there, the windows from the outside and a dining room and a kitchen in the back that gave onto a garden. This very sketchy floor plan, which was published in the catalog raisonné of, of uh, Marceau's work, um, and thanks to RISD librarian Claudia Covert, I'm able to show it to you with a slight bit, bit of overlining, shows you the first two floors of the house, including that, that middle area uh, in the center of the, of the slide with a star, and the star is the room where Bert Morisot had her own bedroom and where a painting we'll be talking about very soon was made. Morisot painted in every room of the house, including the salon, the kitchen, and a rather ingenious bedroom that had an interior window looking down into the salon. I'm going to go back to that floor plan and show you that there is a little peekaboo window here where my cursor is if you can see it to the right of the star that looked down from her bedroom into this two-story salon and that's a view from the salon uh, 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 compliments of the artist bill scott whom i'll mention again later this is a, an exterior view of the window um, and it also faces south as does the salon it was here again that she painted her daughter julie on a snowy day in the winter of 1886. This painting, which is familiar to everyone who's visited the museum, is Bert Morisot's portrait of Julie, entitled Child in a Red Apron. It was purchased by the museum in 2010, a little more than a decade after it had been sold by Julie's descendants. For more than a hundred years, it had belonged to members of the Bert Morisot family, continuing to reflect the freshness and the radical technique of the artist. Like Julie, it spent much of its life on the Rue de Villejuice. Morisot captured her daughter Julie as she peered at a snowy landscape from, from her mother's bedroom. The glint of a brass knob suggests that the window is ajar, while diagonal brushstrokes at the lower left mimic a breeze that rustles the curtains and lifts the ties of Julie's apron. Spiraling and slashing marks animate the setting creating a sense of movement and immediacy. The subject appears quickly drawn, but Marceau worked deliberately and sought the same effects of gesture and transparency, whether she was employing pastel, watercolor, or oil paint. She often proceeded without preliminary sketches, as is the case here, painting with fluid and abbreviated strokes without, completing co without completely covering the white of the canvas. Marceau used the setting again when Julie was 13, and thanks to the artist Bill Scott, who visited Julie's son Clément at this home in the, 18, in the 1980s, we have an intimate view of the window that performed the dual role of interior and exterior motif. When Eugène Manet died in 1892, Marceau lost the joy that they, that they had shared in the house on the Rue de Villejuste and moved with Julie to an apartment closer to the Bois de Boulogne. She continued painting Julie at home, relaxing with her dog or practicing the violin. But in 1895, after nursing Julie through her own illness, Bert Morisot died of pneumonia as a result of a recurrence of the influenza epidemic that had ravaged Europe in the early 1890s. She was 54. In her last letter, she urged Julie to return to the house on the Rue de Villejuste and to live there with her cousins, Paul and Jeanne Gobillard. Under the protection of the family council that Bert had appointed, Julie's guardian, the poet Stéphane Mallarmé, and the painters Edgar Degas and Pierre-Auguste Renoir, Julie's life reestablished a regular course. In 1900, in a dual wedding ceremony, Julie and her cousin Jeanne were happily married. Julie to Ernest Rouard, to whom she had been introduced by Degas, and Jeanne to the poet Paul Valéry, a protégé of Mallarmé. 
Later, the street, the Rue de Villejuste, was named the Rue Paul Valéry. Over the next century, the house remained the apartment block for, for numerous members of the Manet, Mariso, Huar family. And at the time of Julie's death in 1966, she occupied the same apartment on the ground floor where she was painted in 1886. I show you here the plaque that's on the outside of the house, which, which says in this house, built and inhabited by Bert Morisot, uh, also lived and died Paul Valéry. I'll conclude this, this little talk with a slide of Renoir's portrait of Bert Morisot and Julie Benet. For it is their lives that we've considered tonight and whom we've entered through their home. The complexity and intelligence of Morisot's painting, tested again and again on her favorite subject, is really cause for celebration. What a pleasure it has been to welcome her painting into the RISD Museum, a museum that values her contribution and acknowledges her place among the great avant-garde artists of her generation. And finally, I'd like to conclude by offering you a little memento of Paris with thanks to my cousins, Bill and Catherine, whose window looks out on this sparkling tower.